Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello, and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Good afternoon to those of you who are with me here on the East Coast. Uh, my name is Yoni Applebaum. I'm a senior editor at The Atlantic. I'm pleased to be the moderator of today's event, uh, a Commonwealth Club program, The Future of American History Education, What Now? This program is part of Creating Citizens, the Commonwealth Club's new civics education effort launched in 2020. Today, I'm joining you from Washington, D.C., uh, and there probably couldn't be a, a better place or time to discuss these questions. Uh, as I speak to you, uh, straight down 16th Street, there is a rally at the White House. Congress will be sitting at one o'clock to count the electoral votes. Uh, meanwhile, uh, election returns are still rolling in from the state of Georgia, uh, where it appears that the pastor uh, of Martin Luther King's old church has just won election to the United States Senate and, and Democrats appear poised uh, to, with 50 seats, control the Senate uh, going forward. Um, these are historic times uh, and uh, we're not quite sure what history will make of them, uh, but it's a good time for all of us to meet today and think about um, what we make of history. Uh, there is anger in the streets here in DC uh, and there is passion and excitement and engagement. Uh, among the many questions that we asked today are, what does this mean for the education of America's students, uh, particularly around history and the foundational principles of our democracy? Over the past year, the president has pushed an effort around patriotic education and American ideals, in part in the pushback to the New York Times' 1619 project, but also well beyond that. He launched a 1776 commission to promote study of America's founding principles as he sees them. Today's discussion will focus on these issues and the road ahead for American history education. I'm joined today by several terrific experts to discuss these issues, uh, including Jane Kamensky, the Jonathan Trumbull Professor of American History at Harvard University, and the Forsheimer Foundation Director of the Arthur and Elizabeth Schlesinger Library on the History of Women in America at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Working with colleagues across the United States, uh, she serves as one of the leaders of the National Endowment for the Humanities and Department of Education funded project, Educating for American Democracy, a Roadmap for Excellence in History and Civics for All Learners. Ian Rowe is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on education and upward mobility, family formation and adoption. He concurrently serves as a senior visiting fellow at the Woodson Center and a writer for the 1776 Unites campaign. And Michelle Herzog is a history and social science coordinator for the Los Angeles County Office of Education, responsible for providing professional development, resources, and support for K-12 social studies educators throughout the 80 school districts of Los Angeles County. She served on the Educating for American Democracy Steering Committee. Uh, one important housekeeping note that I have for you before we get started. Uh, if you have a question for me or any of the other panelists today, please use the YouTube chat feature. Questions that are asked there will be sent to me throughout the program, and I'll try to pose as many of them as I can to our panelists. Uh, I really couldn't think of a better group to be talking with uh, today as we discuss this critical moment and, and take stock of, of where we are and, and how we see and teach the past. Uh, and with that, uh, I want to begin by, by turning to Professor Kamensky uh, and asking her uh, for her thoughts on how to think about these issues, particularly at this moment. Thanks, Yoni. It's great to be with you all today. Um, as Yoni said, I come from higher ed and a pretty rarefied corner of higher ed at that. Um, I teach the American Revolution at Harvard, offering the first lecture course on the subject in decades, which is a, a, a story in itself. And in that class, I aim to share cutting edge scholarship, um, much of it on the violence of the Revolutionary War, which was our first civil war, and on the ways that the American founding was shot through with the histories of slavery and dispossession. Um, but I also mean for students to take up the work of the American Revolution as a fragile and ongoing project for which their generation bears ultimate responsibility. Um, and in many ways, it's that work and the sense that higher ed needs fresh thinking about its responsibilities 
to primary and secondary ed that brought me to Educating for American Democracy along with Michelle. Um, as a scholar, I'm interested in what we might call the civic humanities, deeply researched, complex, and verifiably true stories told with a lot of why, with explicit civic purpose. Um, we need to acknowledge, as Yoni said, that we hold this discussion at a moment of both peril and possibility. And I think the possibility might be harder for us to see. So I wanna just highlight that at the outset here. Um, we've seen tremendous citizen engagement in the course of the long, vicious 2020 election season. And that's a very good thing. That engagement is not always informed and it too rarely foregrounds the common good or the sense that Americans are one people who can disagree constructively rather than existentially, and those are bad things. We've seen grassroots groups and social media groups uh, from the New Georgia Project, which seems poised for triumph, uh, to Michelle Obama's When We All Vote, undertake tremendous civic activation efforts at massive scale. That's a good thing. But they're playing catch up educating generations of adults who haven't effectively learned history and civics in schools um, and who are too belatedly being given the keys to the country. Um, so we have work to do in schools from pre-K through grade 20 and beyond. If the Educating for American Democracy approach, which we can tell you more about, takes root in primary, secondary, and post-secondary ed, I like to think that we could create a virtuous circle where more students graduate from high school wanting to learn still more about history and government in their post-secondary lives, uh, creating for me more history and government majors, um, and then where more history and government majors want to be K-12 teachers and see that as the glorious civic work that it is. So from my very fortunate perch at Harvard, I can't think of anything that I'd like to have my classroom see and do more. Ian, Jane has given us a uh, reason for, for optimism and, and uh, a reason to think of this moment as one of opportunity. How does that match your mood as you survey the, the landscape of history education? Yeah, well, thank you very much for the opportunity for being here. It really does feel like we are uh, living in history. You know, my context is that for the last 10 years, I ran a network of public charter schools in the heart of the South Bronx and Lower East Side of Manhattan. Uh, 2,000 students, almost all low-income students, black and brown students, who all in search of a better life. You know, like my own family who came to this country in the 60s, um, we understood, my parents certainly understood the country's history of racial oppression and that uh, their own children might face uh, challenges based on race and other factors. And yet they knew that there was an essence of this country, that there were a set of core values around family, faith, hard work, entrepreneurship, that if embraced, could create a pathway from persecution to prosperity. And I think, you know, with all the flaws that do exist in our country, that's something that has always struck me as so important that these principles are worth fighting for. And one of the challenges of creating a sense of possibility in young people is to ensure that they actually have a deep and full understanding of the country that they live in, that they, they, they come to understand even after all, learning all of the flaws, all of the abuses, that we live in a good, if not great country, a country that isn't necessarily hostile to their dreams. And that's something that we spend a lot of time, certainly in the schools that I run, ensuring that young people understand the pathways to success that are within their grasp that have been achieved by millions of Americans by embracing these founding principles. So as you mentioned, the New York Times 1619 project, one of the reasons I think that that created such a stir was that the 1619 project went at the core of these founding principles. You know, the founding principles were false when they were written, that America has anti-Black racism running the very, in the right, very DNA of the country. Imagine if, you were, if you, imagine if you were a Black kid in the heart of the South Bronx, you're nine or 10 years old, or, or in Buffalo or Newark or Chicago, any of some of these worst performing school districts in the country where that curriculum has been embraced. And that's the message that you're hearing about 
the United States. So, so a group of black scholars, we've called ourselves the 1776 Unites group as a function of the, the Woodson Center, came together and said, we think that that's actually a, a biased and somewhat distorted view of the country and actually almost cherry picked history that paints the country as being uh, permanently in the state of oppressor and oppressed. And we need to ensure all of our kids have a full and complete understanding of everything that has been that has transpired in the United States. So we've even gone to the level of creating a, a curriculum, a 1776 Unites curriculum, that seeks to tell, a, a, again, a more complete story. So for example, the Rosenwald schools, which many educators aren't aware of, but in the early 1900s, Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald at the time, the CEO of the Sears company, which was the largest retailer, Booker T. Washington had a vision for exemplary education in a time of segregation. And they partnered together to build more than 5,000 schools in the South exclusively for black students. And the, the, the demonstrated record of increased literacy, uh, community involvement is just extraordinary. One of the most empowering stories about black self-determination under incredibly adverse conditions. And yet not a single mention of the Rosenwald schools in the 1619 project. So our curriculum is seeking to tell all of those stories so that we, we understand warts and all uh, what America uh, has represented and what should be part of a history curriculum for all students. And let me just close by saying, you know, in chapter 13 of de Tocqueville's America, he said, quote, the greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened than any other nation, but rather in her ability to repair her faults, end quote. I've always found that quote really empowering because it accepts that America has a flawed history and yet it has a foundation of principles that allow it to bravely and courageously confront those flaws and continue to move toward this idea of a more perfect union. Thank you for, for sketching all of that out. Michelle, I wanna to come to you now. Uh, we've got an Ian's view of, of the landscape uh, from New York. I'm, I'm curious, you work with a tremendously uh, diverse student population and the educators who, who serve them. Uh, how do these questions look to you in Los Angeles? It's a great question. And again, I wanna join my colleagues here in thanking you for the opportunity to talk on this topic. Um, for me, working with classroom teachers from kindergarten all the way through grade 12, particularly in history and social studies, we're confronted with a number of issues. I'm particularly interested in not just what is taught, but even more specifically how it is taught. How do we entertain these questions and move toward an inquiry-driven approach to teach history in ways that's going to spark more inquiry among students they, we want them to leave with almost more questions than we give them answers to, right? And that sort of shifts a whole different pedagogy around teaching. Um, I started my career actually as an elementary teacher and reading specialist and um, found that quite fascinating because, you know, we often overlook the capacity of very young children to entertain very complex issues and events and ideals, and if you've ever been around a five or a six-year-old or a four-year-old, they know very clearly what's right and wrong, right? What's fair and no fair, not fair. I often tease that my daughter's first two words out of her mouth were no fair because her brother got something she didn't, right? So they understand that. And I think we underestimate bringing some of these complexities to young children. And that's, that's the key is digging into and what my colleagues are alluding to here is Digging into the complexities, you know, traditionally, I think many of us were taught history as just a basic timeline series of events. This happened, then this happened, then this happened. And never really digging into the reasons why the different responses to um, the pushback, the support. And this, what we want to do is present opportunities for them to really dig into those issues and complexities. Um, when I got my history degree at UCLA, it opened my eyes 
to thinking about history in very different ways than what traditionally I was taught, right? That it wasn't just a series of events. There were questions raised. There were stories revealed that were never in the textbooks, that were never in the classroom. And so that brought a sense of, wow, how do I bring that to classrooms? And now in my current role in working with teachers of all grade levels, K-12, how can I help them surface those different stories, nuances, perspectives, but in ways that, I wouldn't say balance, but that provides a full picture, right? Um, we talk about revealing the warts, but how do you teach history in a way that it's not all warts or no warts, right? How do you, how do you create that, well, sense of, in spite of the difficulties and challenges and missteps and mistakes, that there is glimmers of hope. There were people who worked toward a better society, who worked for a greater cause. And how do you highlight them in a way that doesn't neglect or overshadow some of the sacrifices very deeply felt by too many groups at too many times? Um, so that's kind of where I work with teachers and try to help them move to thinking about history in those ways and building their sense of understanding, expanding their knowledge base um, so that they can teach it. One of the big challenges for them is, I think in many states, and when I was president of National Council for Social Studies, I was able to meet with teachers across the country and found very common issues. The vast, not just depth, but huge breadth that they are expected to cover. I mean, it's a race through time, right? Can you imagine teaching a group of 10-year-olds, fifth graders, to teach everything from um, the age of exploration all the way through pre-Civil War in one year? I mean, to do it well, it's virtually impossible, especially at a time when social studies is marginalized uh, in the elementary grades. So they're, race, they're running a race against time to cover everything, but then helping them to do it well is the big challenge. And giving them the background and confidence to do it with um, these tools and abilities and background knowledge themselves to feel confident in doing so. It's a big challenge. Michelle, I want to seize on one of the terrific insights you've just given us all. Um, these conversations often revolve around what should be in the curriculum. Um, and you've just oriented us to think as well about um, how that should be taught. There was a, a popular Broadway show a, a number of years ago, which defined history. And, and I think I'll have to clean this up because we're recording as just one damn thing after another, um, which is not a bad <laughs> definition perhaps of, of what happens in some classrooms. Um, so if, if we're going to, to we'll, we'll come to the question of what we should be teaching in, in a moment, but, but for a moment, I just want to get our, our panelists to engage with this question of whether there are ways to improve how history is taught that, that perhaps will reframe the conversation around what should be taught uh, and, and allow us to slice through some of the thornier problems there um, if, if history is not simply about conveying a, a body of, of facts and beliefs, but rather about uh, maybe teaching a certain way of, of thinking or, or, or asking questions. I'd love to jump in if I could. Um, Michelle, I was flashing during your remarks on to my utter conviction graduating from high school sometime uh, at the uh, end of the last century, um, that of all the things I might do in the world, taking another American history course in my whole life was surely not one of them because of the um, the coverage, you know, the exclusively coverage approach, my textbook, uh, American Pageant, which was the textbook of generations of kids had then, we, we memorized the height and weight of every president, um, <laughs> Taft at 304 pounds, the heaviest. <laughs> so I, and, and efforts to reform history and civics ed, I think have often foundered on the what um, you know, that was the death of the National History Standards effort in 1992-93 was, you know, we couldn't calibrate the number of George Washington's per sojourner truth that would thread its way um, across the partisan spectrum. So, um, you know, what Educating for American Democracy is trying to do is balance the what, the how, and the why um, with an inquiry framework and civic purpose that allows um, sort of deep core sampling 
in places that particularly reveal not only the happenings of the past, but the workings of American constitutional democracy. I guess the other thing, Michelle, that chimed with me from your remarks was your repeated use of the word digging. And I think, you know, these active gerunds, right, digging, sifting, evaluating, wrestling, um, and ultimately coming out with a, a, a humbleness before the past, but also a sense, as Ian was saying, of radical hope about what ordinary people can do in the present and future, um, to me, is the purpose of that kind of active inquiry, which brings what's done even in a pre-K classroom closer to what gets historians like all of us excited in our own work. Yeah, I, I, I would definitely concur with that. And, you know, and also just this idea of not looking at historical events solely through a contemporary lens. I think so often we don't take into account the actual context. So that's why reading original documents is so important because you see founders and other people from history and how they were grappling in their context, in their whatever the factors were, because it's very easy to say, well, I'm looking at this through the lens of, you know, I'm now in 2021, I would have never done that. And, you know, but for challenge kids, challenge kids to say, well, here's what this person was actually facing. Imagine 200 years from now, Someone looking back might say, look at all these people. They had these, they had waters on their desks in plastic bottles. Didn't they realize they were destroying the world? They were, must have been evil. They could never have, um, you know, they, 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 how, how could they possibly have made these decisions? So it's, it's very easy to judge history based on uh, living in a present where all the answers from that point forward have been, are known, they weren't known at the time. And so I think that's something that's always really, really important uh, when looking at historical act events. That's terrific. Let me, let me seize on that and, and pose a, a challenging question. Um, if, if you take this approach to history education, if, if what you're doing is presenting students uh, with primary sources, uh, with analytic essays, asking them to dig, asking them to think critically about what they're encountering, does the curriculum matter? Um, if you're a high school educator, and I know you're, you're not particularly a fan of, of the 1619 Project, Ian, but, but if you took that as a set of sources and, and placed it before students and, and uh, fleshed it out with, with primary materials and, and asked them to engage with it uh, and to engage with it the way they would engage with uh, any set of, of historical essays and sources, uh, that is, um, finding the things in there that resonate, being critical of, of the way sources are presented, um, would that work as well as any other curriculum? That, that is, does the curriculum matter at all or, or do we, uh, can we simply place our faith in, in uh, better and, and more engaged methods of, of historical inquiry in the classroom? Well, the materials certainly matter. I, I don't know if you're suggesting it, it completely random. No, you need a, uh, in my view, a coherent cumulative curriculum, which you know does uh, outline what tra what has transpired in terms of American history. The reason I am particularly focused on original documents is that you there you are seeing the actual history lived out by the people that you're studying. Um, too often there are interpretations such as the 1619 project that again apply current day uh, ideology to past events and the two things could be completely disconnected from each other. Michelle yeah. let me come to you with a, a question yeah. one of our, our viewers has posed. Uh, they're in Texas and, and they're wondering um, that the fights in Texas tend to revolve around curricular standards. Uh, and they're wondering whether whether the focus on the curriculum crowds out the possibility of, of project-based learning, um, whether the effort to, to get everything uh, into um, a single year in, in the survey for, from uh, uh, the first encounters all the way through to um, uh, the, the Civil War or the present um, sort of ends up requiring a, a certain kind of pedagogic approach. Is, is that something you've wrestled with at all? Oh, absolutely. It's a great question. Um, and a lot of it, unfortunately, is driven by assessments that are required in certain states and schools, right? 
So if there is an assessment required at the end of the school year that's going to cover content from this vast breadth, teachers are really challenged to cover all that. Because let's face it, it, let's say you're covering, you're required to cover, say, 100 years of history during a school year, and it's on U.S. history in the 1800s. You could spend all year just on the Civil War and still not cover it as adequately as you would like, right? And you can do it and do it really well, but you have neglected covering those other content areas that might be touched on on the test, that students may not be able to perform. So there's that pressure, right, to, to go quickly through that kind of thing. And that's, that's the challenge. And, some, and often they're right. We'll crowd out project-based learning or inquiry-driven instruction or deep analysis of primary and secondary sources. So there is a real tension there. Um, what I have found in some, in some areas is going back to local control. In some schools and states, if you've got strong leadership at the site or the district level who say, hey, we're not as concerned about the bottom line test result, particularly if it's a standardized test. We want kids to think, we want them to learn, we want them to take away an understanding of how history is complicated then and how life is complicated now. But that takes some really strong leadership um, at different levels. And to convince your school community, well, how much does the test matter? Because the, the reality is it does matter a lot in a lot of areas. And so that's a tough question. Um, so in, in California, they dropped the assessment for social studies. Well, that's a double-edged sword for us, right? Because if it isn't tested, the subject gets marginalized. We get less support. Pretty soon it's less and less taught. But then it's be careful what you wish for, because if you get a multiple choice test, that's just going to assess factoids and dates and how much Taft weighed, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> you're not going to get to that deep historical thinking that we're all aspiring teachers and students to come away with. So I feel like the, the discipline is almost unique at the K-12 level in its allegiance to breadth as the reigning concept, right? Um, and pressures from both the left and the right have perpetuated that sense of what the discipline does, right? So the, um, you know, from the left, a version of inclusiveness that has resulted in accretive standards, right? Add another group whose history has to be mastered uh, without taking anything away, without adding degrees of focus. Um, I wonder it, you know, in the Wikipedia world where anybody can learn quite well verified content about anything at the click of a button and where our five-year-olds can do it more adeptly than we can, what we might learn from the STEM disciplines, which don't have this concept of breadth, but have a concept of foundation and activatable knowledge that is experimental and phenomenological at the very earliest stages, um, but that also has, you know, borderline axioms and truths that, um, uh, you know, things don't fall up. So, um, you know, what we're trying for in Educating for American Democracy is inquiry-based learning that is not content, content neutral or content free, but that doesn't depend on mastering the history of every moment and every group, um, rather giving the tools that a citizen learner can take in small c citizen learner can take into all the other realms of our lives. And, and I think, you know, we're hoping, especially at the K-5 grade level, for real partnership from English language arts and STEM teaching, because um, maybe that's the age where the disciplines are less uh, set in their ways. But how far how far can you push that? And and uh, I ask this, I sort of wonder, could you do a history education uh, which is solely based uh, in, in America in the 20th century and rely on students to go on Wikipedia to, to find out that there was a revolution? Like, are there limits to to that kind of pedagogic approach? Well, you can have culminating projects that require that kind of interdisciplinary analysis. Yeah, I think you can. I mean, uh, you know, as as Michelle said, a lot of this has to be coordinated, similar to what it sounds like you experienced in California. In New York in 2010, the State Department of Regents decided to eliminate the social studies exam. And literally, you can see over the last 10 years, the amount of time in the average school day 
where the, a kid was getting five days of social studies and history, great substantive content, now on average is only between one to two days. And that other time has been replaced by content-free um, uh, material, which is all about finding the main idea uh, without actually adding substantively to the body of knowledge that kids need, I mean, it's very Edie Hirsch, but that kids need to function in our society. So I, I do think there's a way to get there. There has to be coordinated agreement though, that assessments in addition to curriculum and standards are all working in line with each other as opposed to actually working in opposition because that's what we've been getting through these assessments. But this is not a simple needle to thread, right? On, on the one hand, if you've got the tests, you you, you risk the forced march through the content. Uh, and, and if you junk the tests, but that's then you're test design. But that's test design. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. test design. We've advocated a lot for performance based assessments, right, in history um, that can really measure some of the yeah. deep critical thinking we want to see. And to add on to what Jane's saying, I think we have, this is a good opportunity. I don't mean to paint such a grim picture, but if you look outside of history instruction, the way STEM is taught, the way math is taught now, even English, especially if you're a state that's adopted the common core or the common core approach, it's about um, problem solving, critical thinking, going beyond the Wikipedia approach to teaching. And if the other disciplines are moving in that direction, why not history, right? So that's our rationale. So think about it. Your students are not in your third period history class all day long. From you, they go to math, they go to English, they go to these other subjects that are taught through an inquiry-driven approach. Why aren't we being consistent in approaching history education that same way? This is sort of the, the marketing technique we're trying to use to help teachers move in this direction that it's not just the march through time, um, that we're wanting, if we want kids to use that same pedagogical approach when teaching history and social studies. So I wanna stand up for the olden days though for a minute. So you, you, only, you only gave us the provocation, could we imagine only staying in the 20th century? Um, I'll plant two flags. First, teaching American history to the students of America in the United States. Um, it's, it's crucial that they know something about the founding history and principles of the country. Um, and it's crucial too, I think, sort of humanistically and philosophically as kids orient themselves in the world, that they learn something about deep time and, uh, and moments when people lived, as Ian was saying before, uh, people lived lived our past facing forward to their future. That's a really important, um, uh, takeaway from history that I still am teaching to graduate students, right? It's not, it's not easy. And I think deeper time to get that sense of the different complexities um, and contexts of our past as a people um, is vital. Whether we could cover the past by doing something that's much closer in approach and in content to a case study method um, than a, uh, you know, so I would say uh, the olden days are important, but the revolution is more important than the World War of 1812. Um, the Industrial Revolution is maybe as important as the Mexican War, though the Mexican War may be more important to students in California and Texas than it is to students in New England and the upper Midwest. Um, so maybe post holes rather than the sort of whole cloth method could serve us. And, and, and to, to Jane's point, I think the act of prioritizing what is most important is something that we have to do. I think what, what's happened now in sort of a politically divided culture is that there are lots of people competing now to say what is the most important element of American history. And that divisiveness, in my view, is actually leading to people saying they just don't want to engage. So let's not even teach this stuff in the first place. And that is, you know, only people who suffer in that approach are our kids who are not getting a sense of our country. Corner of mine, we uh, talk a lot um, about, do you want to teach well and slow down and teach well, or do you want to teach fast? So these are the conundrums that teachers are faced with all the time. Where can I slow down and go deep? dig into a topic that we feel are most important, like the ones you're alluding to. But there's a cost of going fast in other areas, too, if there's some local, like you said, like you alluded to, Jane, 
um, interest in those areas. The big question for us, and if you have children of your own around the dinner table, it's why do I have to know this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Why is this important? It's a bunch of stuff that happened a long time ago. But what I love to see most is when teachers connect that past to what's happening today, right? The lessons of the past will remain in the past if we don't connect the dots to events and people and things that are happening in today's world. If we're not learning from it and moving forward, you talk about the revolution today needs to continue. Yes, we're standing on the shoulders of all of the past events and people of our American past. How do we build on that? Um, how do we learn from that? And I think that's a piece that's been largely missing. When we talk about civic learning, that's where it leads right to civics, right? How do we engage and make history today by learning about what works, what doesn't work, um, and building on our own knowledge to create a better society for all? I want to I'm ask, sure, I'm, I'm, how to thread another needle, but, but first I just want to remind our audience that uh, you can submit your own questions for the panel uh, by putting them in the comments of, of the YouTube stream. Um, and, and the question I want to pose, Jane, and, and I hope you'll, you'll jump in here, um, th there is a, a certain tension that I'm hearing where on the one hand, Ian tells us that um, the danger of, of many contemporary his, history curricula is that they see the past through the lens of the present. Um, and, and Michelle reminds us that, that students need to understand uh, that these uh, are, are foundational pieces of knowledge that they're going to require in order to interpret the present. And if they're not making those connections, they won't be engaged. Um, is that a false tension? Is, is there a way to thread that? No, I think, um, I think part of our sense of that tension is comes from the fact that first higher ed and then PTAs and K-12 evacuated these spaces in the last moment of um, partisan collapse in the late 1960s, right? We, we waded out of this territory because it seemed too fraught, um, this tension between uh, the immediate relevance of the present and the sort of stable content of the past. So I'm, I'm interested in how we can be true to the past and, and teach the ability to to evaluate closer, tr closer to objective truth and farther from objective truth. That's clearly needed in our society, but also empower teachers and their parent communities to be courageous about why wading into subjects about which there is disagreement um, in order to teach those evidence sifting skills that will allow us to disagree better, more civically and more productively. So, uh, you know, Ian and and Michelle, with their K twelve experience in different ways, um, have a much better sense than I do about how to empower not just the great teacher but the average teacher to be skillful and fearless. Um, so, not just not just um, good rather than fast, but also courageous um, and yet supportive. How do you do that? Ian, we've got a, a high school teacher in, in our comments who, who says that they increasingly feel like they are walking on eggshells in the classroom. Uh, what would you say to that teacher? Thank you for doing your job on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I, I empathize with it. You know, one, one thing I'll say in defense of the 1619 project is that they clearly have unearthed a desire for teachers like your questioner to grapple with these questions with their kids. You know, America has a very complicated history. And so teachers are yearning for materials to tell that story. Uh, you know, in the, in turn, in, with the group that we launched, 1776 Unites, we created this curriculum, again, because we thought that the 1619 Project was so cherry-picked to, to uh, you know, fill in this narrative of a racist and irredeemably racist country. We said, you know what, let's use a strategy of storytelling. Let's create great materials that teachers that are interested in teaching this can, ha can feel more confident that they can have these discussions. So for example, Biddy Mason, who is a, a woman born a slave and ultimately died a millionaire and a philanthropist, an incredible story. We now have a whole curriculum unit on Biddy Mason that goes through the life that she led, the struggles that she uh, had to overcome 
all of the abuses, and yet she was able to embrace these principles around faith, family. She was a great entrepreneur. Those are the ways in which we're trying to connect the past to the present. Because at the end of each unit, we want to ask the kids, what did you see in Biddy Mason's story that you think can resonate with your own? And how do you think you could now apply this in your own contemporary life? We think those helping teachers, uh, you know, is, you know, by providing these kinds of materials, that, again, that we think tell a more complete story that's not running away from the negative aspects of our country, but also highlighting those stories about average individuals who were able to overcome by embracing principles that are as available to you today as they were 200 years ago. And, you know, thank you to that teacher, but, you know, take a look at our uh, 1776unites.com website. There's curricula there that hopefully can help you have those kinds of conversations without being walking, without walking on eggshells. Yeah, I think that's a great example because stories like that are empowering to young people today, but you have to do it with wide-eyed empowerment, right? Understanding that wasn't so easy for Biddy Mason. <laughs> right. She faced a lot of threats and discrimination. And so where do you draw the line? But I'm really glad the teacher raised that issue because that's something we need to focus on. You know, kids are watching the news today just like we are. And unfortunately, most of them are watching it through social media. So they're getting all kinds of different points of view of that. But they're concerned. They're hearing. They're watching. They're very attuned. They want to come to school and talk about these issues. But we're finding more and more this this issue of fear in the classroom because these things have become so politically motivated now so politicized that teachers are very nervous and rightfully so to bring up some of these topics in the classroom because kids are coming with those political ideologies as well they're bringing them from home and we're finding unfortunately even though this is a prime time to have discussions in classrooms about these controversial issues Unfortunately, finding more teachers fearful of doing so. Things are so politicized now, but it's more important than ever. And this is where civics plays a very, very important role. There are approaches and strategies that teachers can find on how to facilitate these conversations about controversial issues. Dr. Diana Hess at University of Wisconsin-Madison is our primary go-to. She's a leader in this at the national front. Structured Academic Controversy, Socratic Seminar, Philosophical Chairs, Constitutional Rights Foundation. A lot of these civic ed organizations have great materials to help facilitate those conversations. They need to occur in classrooms because that's how we're going to prepare young people to address and discuss issues in ways that are respectful, that are civil. Unfortunately, not being modeled so much in our, today, in our political landscape today, but if we can teach young people today how to discuss something that is controversial with people with different views in ways that are respectful and civil, that's how we strengthen our democracy. And there are many who feel that the lack of civic learning in several years past, we talk about the marginalization of history, marginalization of civics is even, has even been worse. So when we don't provide those opportunities, many feel that a lack of that over the last years has, well, led to where we are today. The when lack I, when, of I, when I hear people. the walking on eggshells question, I, I'm aware that it means different things to the left and to the right. Um, but I think, you know, across the political spectrum, it does testify correctly to a brittleness in our current civic culture and to the, the extent to which we see competing absolutisms and a sense of, um, in some young people, including my two young Robespierre sons who are uh, home from college downstairs, a sense that they're not groping toward a more, more perfect union. They have the perfect answer, right? Um, uh, and you bring competing absolutisms to a conversation in a classroom over a difficult issue and you have a disaster. I, I share Michelle's sense that more nuanced historical and civic education braided together will equip young people to do better, to, to bring a less brittle um, t 
texture to our uh, to our political culture in the future. I, I will um, confess that I share that sense of walking on eggshells when I come to my own incredibly privileged classroom and teach issues around race, gender, sexuality. Um, uh, you know, we need we need to. I think part of the the empathy and humility that our core historical skills um, uh, can help students to do better, uh, to be more not not prissy civil with each other, right? Not sort of fakey fakey clutch my pearls or don't clutch my pearls civility, but a kind of generosity and willingness to. Um, uh, to build coalition and to think about where compromise uh, can be constructive, right? So let me let me sort of put a point on this. One of our questioners asks uh, about the Tulsa massacre, um, a horrifying incident in the American past um, that they think uh, ought to be in, in history curricula and, and generally is not. Uh, it's an incident we're still metaphorically and literally still excavating. Um, that's harder to teach in, in some ways, perhaps, than, than a Black entrepreneur. Um, it's, it's not going to, to provide an inspirational example for students, uh, I suspect. So it, if the emphasis in curricula is on inculcating civic virtues and providing inspirational stories, is there room in the history classroom for Tulsa? Of course there is. I mean, what's interesting about the Tulsa massacre is that uh, it very much should be taught in American history. But what is always interesting is that when folks do focus on it, it's the only thing they focus on as opposed to or in addition to all the entrepreneurship and innovation that was happening in Tulsa. Like the, the number of black businesses that were being developed, the level of entrepreneurship, the level of wealth that was being generated, which, by the way, a significant portion of which was uh, replaced after the Tulsa massacre. So it's really important to say that, wow, even in that time, there was a thriving black community that was accessing venture capital, that was supporting each other in the community. And yes, of course, it was massacred. So that's, a, that's an important part of the story. But clearly there was something there that was accessible to a large community of black people who were entering the middle and upper class through entrepreneurship. And if it was accessible then, why can't that be accessible now? And so there is a way to tell that story, but tell the complete story, not only the massacre, because that perpetuates this vision of oppressor oppressed and the inability to succeed when clearly there was a large population that was doing so. So teach the Black Wall Street and the massacre. A absolutely, it, warts and all. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, I mean, each kid will have to assess, you know, which part of the history are they going to, uh, you know, grapple with. And, you know, but the hope is that you have a full understanding of our country, recognizing the founding ideals weren't even lived up to by the founders themselves, as brilliant as they were. And yet there is power within those founding principles, that they're accessible to you today as they were hundreds of years ago. And that the embrace of those still, even with all of the struggles, is a pathway from persecution to prosperity. And it's really important. Kids of all races understand that. I'm, I'm struck in this conversation that there seem to be multiple objectives in, in the history classroom. Uh, and, and perhaps I'm, I'm misinterpreting, but... but uh, th there is one strain of these comments, which is about molding citizens, uh, about creating functional members of the American Republic and, and the kinds of knowledge and skills and dispositions that we might wish them to have. Uh, a second strain about seeing the past clearly, um, although everybody sees it clearly and, and yet a little bit differently, it seems. Um, and it may be a third strain about um, skills. Uh, and, and we have some questions here about whether or not students can be taught uh, to process information, to recognize conspiracy theories, to, to sift uh, fact from fiction. Uh, um, these, these things would seem it, it, to be broadly compatible in the abstract and yet uh, to jostle up against each other and, and uh, the, the requirements of, of overstuffed curricula uh, in practice. Um, how do we weight those objectives against each other? Are those the proper objectives maybe is the place to start? I think so, it's that and boy, even more. I mean, you think about the world our young people are in now, their over-reliance on social media, 
Um, you talked about fact versus fiction. Um, you know, Sam Weinberg at Stanford University mm-hmm. is doing some great work with civic online reasoning and helping teachers help students um, learn what's true, what's not true. Um, you know, when we were growing up, we used we grew up with, well, if it's in the book, it must be true. For young people, well, if it's on the internet, it must be true. Well, we know that's not always the case. Um, so, yeah, I, I would agree there's, there's all of those objectives and much more. And that's, that creates, teachers are working really hard to try to cover all that. And um, without the proper support at their school level, their district level, their state level, for professional development, for resources, they're not given all the tools that we're really going to help them succeed. And I'll tell you, as a classroom teacher, I never taught any two years the same. Every year you'd build on the last year. You'd learn things all the time. Every class of kids was different. You were constantly adapting and working to meet the needs and open kids' eyes and like I said, have them leave with more questions than answers. Jane, I guess I, I would agree. I, I wanted to push back on um, on molding citizens, which I think sounds a little 1950, right? Like where um, uh, K-12 education is part of a consensus-based Americanization project that's going to work a little like a Play-Doh fun factory and take – um, uh, what we then thought of was a, as a melting pot of great diversity on in one end and squeeze them out as citizens at the other end. Um, and I think part of the reason that we evacuated civic education in the post 60s era was that that version of the United States and of the role of schools had come to seem false or insufficient. Um, I think in, if you thought in terms of capacitating citizens rather than molding them, Yoni, you might bring those three strands together with the recognition that um, we're asking these young people, both capital C citizens and not, to take the reins of an incredibly complex form of government, a burdensome form of government for all of us. One of the reasons that we see, I think, the tendencies to authoritarianism that we see around the world is that democracy is so hard. Um, it's a it's a challenge for which we need to capacitate citizens and uh, and empower them with the skills and tools to take up its burdens. So to me, if we can do that without thinking of molding and sanding down the edges of a diversity and inclusiveness that I think we've come rightly to value more in the 21st century than we did um, in that earlier model, that we might bring. Um, content, civic purpose, and civic skills fruitfully together. We're not trying to churn out a, a succession of students in agreement with each other. We're trying to, to build students who disagree with each other more constructively and, and uh, in a way that, that can help us constitute a better civic realm. Does that sound like the right vision to you, Ian? Yeah, I, I, yeah I, yes, I would say that. And I, and I would say that your objectives are correct. I would just make them sequential as opposed to parallel. You know, because remember, we're still in a country where only one third of all students are reading at grade level based on the nation's report card. One of the reasons I love um, Edie Hirsch's ideology around this idea of a core body of knowledge is not only that there is a there, there is an assumed um, understanding that that uh, we want all kids to have is also a, build, a strategy to build literacy skills, to build vocabulary, especially in the early grades. Now, in most elementary schools in the country, we're not getting just the foundational content that builds the vocabulary and background knowledge, which then makes it possible to do all the other objectives that you're talking about. So rather than overburdening um, teachers with all of the objectives simultaneously, I think there's a foundational element, and this is where I think, again, Edie Hirsch has gotten it right for many years. There is a body of knowledge that's good for kids to know to become good citizens, as well as the foundation to build strong literacy and reading skills. And so that, so I, I, I would just shift your objectives there to, so there's a foundational element that's gotta be built before we can take on those multiple objectives. So we've got about five minutes here, and, and I want to make sure that we hear from each of you uh, again. Uh, M- Michelle, let me circle this around back back to you. 
we're talking about how to sort of um, build the history curriculum. And, and one thing that, that's been uh, neglected that Ian's, I think, rightfully called us back to is, is thinking of this as a spiraling curriculum where you'll revisit some of the same topics and, and some of the same periods um, over the course of a student's time in the educational system. But, but also uh, that the curriculum has to be constructed and you know, reminds us in, in a way uh, that, that's accretive, that, that allows the students to build the skills so that if they're coming out uh, of the other end of, of the American education factory as, as uh, students who can disagree with each other constructively, uh, um, that's the final capstone skill and, and they've needed to master these, these other more basic skills along the way. D does that sound like a viable vision to you? Yeah, because you're building on prior knowledge and having kids as they spiral up, dig deeper into maybe some of the same events and topics, um, but asking more questions, looking for different points of view, different impacts on different peoples, um, that it's not a straight, it's not a straight story. It's complicated, right? My son, the philosophy student, Sometimes life is complicated. I think I would say always life is complicated, right? There's always another peeling of the onion you can do to bring upon different points of view and impacts, like I said. Um, and that's what, that's what we want to move students to. And then, like I said, what does it mean to you today? Look around in the world and what, what is going on in the world today? How will this period that we're living through between the electoral uh, work that's going on, right, and what's happening today in Congress, and this pandemic, how will that be taught in 20, 30 years? Is going to depend on who's writing the book, who's buying the book, and who's teaching it, and what questions are going to be raised, and what are we learning from this, and what does it mean to empower us to move forward in a democratic society? Well, that, that's sort of a, a great question. Let me flip this over to you, Jane. If, if uh, you were writing a, a history curriculum um, 20 years hence uh, and had to think about the years 2016 to 2020, does it go in there as, as one of your, your tent poles, one of the, the uh, episodes that, that requires critical uh, engagement and, and a basic mastery of fact? Um, what seems most salient to you about these these four years and in our moment, or, or maybe it, it just ends up on the cutting room floor as, as no, one of the I, I think it's a crucial I think it's a crucial turning point moment, and I hope it will be a positive one. I've I've become a kind of radical optimist in the course of the pandemic, which um, uh, would be improbable, Yoni, to you who have known me for years. Um, you know, I, I think we will understand it as a turning point, and I hope that the um, the engagement, the voter engagement we've seen, um, it builds on itself. That it will be a turning point in the um, the responsibility of citizens of the United States uh, to participate in their government and in the engagement of sort of 16 to 18 year olds. I guess I would like to see um, a braid of content skills and civic capacities spiral all the way along. I don't think of the content as being the base and then the civic capacities and skills as being the superstructure that they can get later. I want that STEM experimental approach from the very beginning where they're learning content through those crucial um, not only English language arts literacy skills, but evidence literacy skills, um, uh, civic friendship skills um, all the way from the youngest forward. And then I think we'll have a spiral that can take off from this 16 to 20 uh, moment and make it um, a, a springboard rather than a crisis point. Ian, one of our audience members is an eighth grade history teacher in Los Angeles oh. who says that, that their classroom works best when they try to strike a balance between listening to their students and, and adapting uh, the, the lessons and the curriculum in, in response. Uh, um, if, if you had to help that eighth grade history teacher teach this moment, um, what, what advice would you give them? You know, I, I think I'd give them the advice that each of their students, like our country, has within them the tools of self-betterment and self-renewal that our constitution was written in such a way that even when it was written, it may not have applied to everyone, its core values and principles that it represented have allowed us to blossom 
and progress as a nation. Like the United States still, we're built for progress. We're built for self-improvement. And I think the message is that we've got to understand our past. We've got to understand our history, but we're not bound by it. We have the capacity to improve both the founding documents and each of the students in his or her classroom has that same ability to improve. That's what we call personal agency. And I think that's the inspiring message of this country. Really, once you understand it, warts and all, this is not running away from the atrocious elements of our past, but understanding how we've embraced the principles to overcome them. And uh, and I'm, I'm really thankful that that person is running schools because we need more inspired individuals to take on the task of inspiring the rising generation to take advantage of everything this country has to offer. The worst thing we can do is make it so doomsday-ish that we're not even attracting people to do this important work. I'm very sorry to say that we've run into the same problem as, as history education. Uh, there's far more interesting things for us to discuss than we have time available in which to discuss them. Uh, unfortunately, this, this uh, needs to be the end of our uh, program today, but I want to thank our speakers uh, and, of course, the Commonwealth Club, our host for today's program. The club will soon be posting this video along with other civic education resources on its website at www.commonwealthclub, one word, Org. I'm Yoni Applebaum of The Atlantic, and this special virtual program of the Commonwealth Club is concluded. <laughs>